On the next episode of Painting and Travel, Sarah talks with a company that manufactures artists' oil paints. Roger sets up his easel and uses oils to create a country driveway in the early morning hours at a farm near Rowan, Indiana. Today we're in Indiana and we're on a 150 year old homestead and there's so many beautiful compositions here. I picked up my oils yesterday and I did this road. I was particularly attracted to this because of the way the road went down and then back up again. It just made a lovely composition. And right over here there's a field of soybeans and I did this painting early this morning. And then it was quite overcast very early this morning and it still is and I hope it keeps that way and I did this small painting slightly different from the one I did yesterday and location makes such a difference when you're doing a composition and a few feet here or there just changes the whole look of the painting. I like this small piece and especially the simplicity of it so I'm going to take this put it aside and I've got this same scene in front of me now and I'll be I'm going to do a small painting of that. This is on masonite and I put a thin coat of burnt sienna on here with acrylic so that's dry now and I'm using oil paints today and later on we're going to visit a factory where they actually manufacture oil paints. I already have my paints out here on my palette and here are the remnants from the paintings I did just a few hours ago. I'm going to start with a dark color and begin to lay in this composition and I did especially like this because it had so many different layers to it just sort of up down and different views of these fields as they go back in the distance. I generally don't do thumbnails before I start a painting I always just dive in and start but this little painting here I did I took some time and I considered the composition. I can also refer to this little sketch and maybe it will speed my composition along because I don't want to change my composition much from what I have here. It really doesn't matter what color I use to sketch my composition in here but I generally like to use a dark color because with oil paints it's very different than using acrylic paints and I'm much more careful when I use oils than when I use acrylics because if I make a mistake in using acrylics I just have to wait a, a few minutes and then I can paint right over that. But that's not the case with oils. If I make a mistake with oils or I get the wrong color on there, uh, you have two choices. I can either let it dry, which I don't want to do, or I can wipe it out. So I'm a little more cautious whenever I use oil paints. I've got that road coming into the foreground here. This is nice because this really leads the eye into this composition. I'm going to start with some darks here and I'll put those two distant trees in there. Now there are more trees here in the foreground. I'm going to leave all those out. This is a beautiful overcast day although the sun keeps popping out now and again. Over here we have a, another bank and here we have a lot of soybeans growing right in this area. Same over this side there's lots of soybeans. So we have sort of a little trough here in the in the center uh, differentiated by different kinds of color and grass and things. Back here we have some corn and then right back here we have the horizon. So see we have many many different layers to the painting and that will help to give it some depth. I'm using a bit of a dry brush to apply this paint without very much thinner. If I were to use much thinner it would get this soupy and it would not dry at all. It would just be kind of runny. I have a wide range of 
colors on my palette and often I'll just use three or four different colors on my palette. But there are so many beautiful different greens out here in the farmland that I wanted to uh, experiment by using a number of different greens. Now often that can be a problem because if you have too many different colors on the palette, uh, it can give you too many choices and it's easy for the painting to become disharmonious by having too many different choices. So I have to keep that in mind as I paint. Now what does happen with any landscape like this is all the colors in the foreground are much more intense than the colors in the background. And I can really see that here. The grass right here in the foreground is very brilliant green. As it goes back in the distance, the color starts to disappear a bit and it gets a bit grayer and there's not as much contrast. Up here on the fields where the soybeans are, that's a totally different color. It's almost a bluish green. So I'm going to take the cerulean blue and use that here. But my main concern here is coloring the canvas as much as I can because as I do this, things are going to change. I may really think that that's exactly the right color on here, but as I start to place other colors on here, I'll probably find that that may not be the right color. I'll have to change it. And that's one reason working with oils that I have to be a little more cautious than working with acrylics. With the acrylics, if it's not the right color, wait a minute, paint over it. I did tone this board with the burnt sienna, and that's very helpful because as I scumble this on here, some of that warmth can show through the board. Give it a nice warmth underneath. Now, if it's, this were just white underneath here, that white would show through and it just wouldn't give me the warmth that the burnt sienna does. I see some cadmium yellow and some cerulean blue. That gives me a, quite a brilliant green. I'm going to not make that green as brilliant as I want it to be because I want to be able to put some of the lights over the darks. So I'll make this slightly darker than I think this grass is going to end up. A little bit further on in the painting, I'll scumble some lighter tones over that. I'm not really worried about any detail at this point. I'm just getting these large shapes in and the large patterns. It's really the most important part of the whole procedure is to get them, get it covered with large shapes. Down here we have a lot of yellow foliage and flowers mixed amongst some grass that uh, looks a little bit lighter and a little bit warmer in color. More on the yellow ochre side. Put some of that in. And then over this side, same thing. One good reason not to spend a lot of time with detail yet is maybe I want to move that road a little bit later on. And if I invest too much time and effort in that detail, then I'm less likely to make changes that might improve the painting. Now we get the uh, field way back here. And as I look over there, it's very warm color because that's corn over there. This is all corn for uh, cattle and feed for animals. And that's quite light. And as it goes back in the distance, of course, these light tones tend to get washed out with color. So this will be much more intense down here. And as it goes back, the intensity drops off as it goes back. This nice overcast. I love this overcast weather. So I'll mix up some blue and some brown here. That'll give me a gray, gray tone. Now this is a gray palette here. So as I mix this, I can see this is a middle tone gray. See, it's just about the, the same value as my palette. But of course, as I look at the sky, I can tell that the sky is the brightest thing going right now. So middle tone is not the right value for the sky. And that's a nice advantage of having this middle tone gray here on the palette. So I'll mix some white with that because the values are the most important part of the painting. If I don't get all the colors right on the mark, but the values are close, the painting will, will survive. And that's, of course, why black and white photos work or black and white pencil drawings work because of the values. Okay, I want that to be a nice soft edge back there where these trees are. I'll soften that in a few moments. Right in the very distance over there, we have a line of trees sort of in the haze. So 
with some cerulean blue. I'll make that distant line of trees way back there. That maybe is a little bit too blue. So I'll just dip into my brown here and gray that. And I want this edge to be very soft, which is easy to do with oils. It's uh, much more difficult to do with acrylics because acrylics will dry very fast, especially out here in the, in the wind and the, the weather. As I'm looking at the road, it tends to be very warm in color, very yellow ochre-ish. So I'll pick up my white and yellow ochre-ish. Now, it's slightly darker than the value of the sky. Let me see. I've got to place this in here very carefully. We have the road coming up here. It sort of flattens out, continues on, and then we can't see it because of this ridge. And here's where the driveway is comes down the hill, flares out as it comes down. It just sort of has an arc to it. And of course it starts to get wider as it comes closer to me. Oh, here comes the sun. The sun changes everything. You know, it's, it's one of the difficulties of painting outdoors is when the sun pops out like that, well, you know, all bets are off as to what you just saw a minute ago. But having said that, painting outside and on location like this, so much can be learned about colors that just cannot be uh, surmised from a photograph. Photographs just tend to flatten everything out, all the darks. For, for instance, in this tree back here, I can see lots of variations of green. I don't have those greens in there yet. But if I were to take a photograph, that photograph would be very, very dark back there in those trees and I wouldn't see all the beautiful colors that I see in real life. And I'll be adding some of those colors in a little while. Okay, this road comes up here and we have it coming towards me. Something inviting about paintings with roads in them for me. I have done so many paintings of roads, even highways with yellow and white stripes on them. I always find them very intriguing and very inviting. I don't know, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just a, uh, an idea that it's going somewhere, travel. But I do enjoy painting uh, scenes with some kind of a road in them, whether they be dirt roads or even highways. This is not a well-worn path right up here. So we have a lot of patches of grass in here. This is nice because this burnt sienna is glowing through there. All right, so this is a good place to be in a painting because everything is covered on the board. I have left nothing untouched. So now the second stage of a painting like this is to go in and start refining these areas. And I have to be careful not to lose the big areas that I've established. I can go in and put in lights and darks in these areas as long as I don't lose the whole big shape of the area. If I do that, the painting is liable to become a little bit splotchy and I'll lose the composition. You see down here we have a, looks like a fence line. I'm trying to deal with the perspective a little bit here. As this comes out, it starts to spread apart. Right on the edge of the road, we have some brilliant grass, green grass. that has been newly mowed. Phthalo green is one color I seldom use because it is just so intense. But I think I'll take this phthalo green, mix it with some cadmium yellow and a touch of white. That's going to give me some very intense, brilliant green right down along the side of this road. And then I'm going to use some of it up in this area as well. And right here, we'll, we'll make this more intense right on the ridge. There's some sunlight coming across this ridge right here where this comes up over the road. It's much easier to put light colors over dark colors in oil paints. With acrylics, it doesn't matter that much. But if I were to put a dark patch right here, the only way I could do that was it would be to mix up the paint quite thick and lay it on there and leave it. If I were to blend it at all, it would mix in with this lighter color and make a chalky, lighter tone. This area here is pretty flat. Let me add some of the lighter greens up here to these trees. If you're finding that your greens that you're using are all pretty much the same, try and add a bit of red to your green or orange, some color like that. Complementary color will 
change your greens quite a bit. Now I have intentionally left a little bit of space right around this tree so these two colors don't mix together. And in a few minutes I will soften those edges by taking the tree and dragging it up into the sky. Or I could conversely take some of the sky color and drag it down into the tree. However, there is a problem with that, and I'll tell you that in a minute. The nice thing about painting is I can be selective. There are lots of other trees in here, but I'm just simply leaving them out. Often a good policy to leave things out of a painting rather than uh, always having the feeling you have to put every single thing in. These trees over here are too dark, so let's lighten them a bit, and I'll add touch of blue to push those in the back. And even though I'm not seeing that blue quite as much as I'm putting in here, uh, by adding this blue color, it will push these trees into the background. Down here on the base, this will be darker down there. So maybe I'll just wipe my brush off and just drag those colors down and leave this kind of a dark color. A few trees way in the distance here. Put a few of those in with a, just a stroke or two. That's all it needs. Now I want to soften these trees. The easiest way is to take the color that's already on the tree, which is of course wet, and just drag that up into the sky. Now I could drag the sky down into the tree, but I'll show you what happens when I do that. I'll wipe my brush off. I'll take some of this sky color. I'll drag it into this tree, but what remains on the brush is some of this dark color from the tree. So if I place that on there again, I'll have a dark color. And then I just have to deal with that and have to wipe it out. So for me, it's best to take the dark color and blend it into the lighter color. The only way to prevent that, of course, is to wipe the brush off on every single stroke. So I would have to drag it in, wipe my brush off, drag it in, wipe my brush off like that. The corn that's over in the distant field, right down towards the bottom, it gets dark here. It goes up the hill slightly. And of course, at the top of this corn, it's getting hit by the direct light that's coming down on it. It's very yellow-green. And I'm going to make it quite yellow. And I'll just load my brush up and just touch that very lightly. I have to keep picking up some more paint because what's happening again is this is picking up the color underneath. And a few small touches right there and that'll indicate a few trunks of a tree there. Here on the edge of the drive, you've got sort of a shadow area right here. A touch of red and blue mixed in with that green. Over here, Kind of the same thing. Just a little dark tone to define the edge of that road. Now as things get closer to me here, I see more and more detail. Back here I see very little detail. Those mountains, the trees, all this tree line, it becomes one shape. I don't see individual trees anymore. But as things get closer, then I start to see individual little areas. Right on this ridge, it's high, so I'm going to make that slightly lighter and brighter. That's going to blend with this wet color in the background. I'm using a lot of uh, vertical strokes here to sort of indicate the grass. The soybeans uh, are planted in rows, although they're very, very tight. So you can't see much as far as the, the rows go. But I'm going to add a few of those rows on there because I can see them. And there's a perspective to these, so the, as these go down here, they start to flare out that way. So as they go out this way, they'll continue to go out. Even if I didn't put any paint on the brush, just the different stroke would, uh, within the wet paint would indicate a few of those. Right here we have some more soybeans, so I'm going to add just a couple of rows on that. So I'm making this all sort of go out this way to give that some perspective. Now for some highlights. On this road, right up here, and I did that on this smaller painting earlier, 
I sort of wanted a nice accent right here where the uh, driveway comes in from the main road. So I'm going to make that lighter. Put a little patch of sunlight on there even though there's no direct sunlight hitting it at the moment. And then I can see just a touch of this road that goes down. Now we have these trees here and they're going to cast a bit of a shadow here. So this will be a little dark and then I'm going to pick up this light again and start down here. Now I added some light green here on the, this ridge, so I'm going to add some light tones on the road to uh, sort of pick up on that same little look. As you can see, I'm leaving some of this burnt sienna and letting it glow through. There are a few barns back there in the, in the very far distance. Well, it might be fun. I'll just put one or two of those in there with this light color here light warm color, just with a stroke or two. Just to add an indication of a few little structures. Maybe one there, maybe another one way in the distance. And put a little dark shadow beside that. There we go. A few touches of bright yellow where these flowers are here. You have to be careful with these bright colors in the distance, especially with flowers. Don't want to add too many flowers because it gets, the painting can get a little bit too sweet for my taste if I add too many. I think I need a few more darks in here. There is a fence line right down here. It looks like a fence line. A dark color, ultramarine blue and burnt umber. Make this darker coming in here. And just with a little flip of the brush, make something that might look like a few fence posts. It's important to build the painting up slowly. Then I can put in a few of these special little touches like these highlights. And they'll make a big difference in a painting. But unless I were to do all this foundation work to begin with, I wouldn't be able to accomplish this in quite the same way. Well, since I've been using oils today, maybe this would be a good time to visit the factory where these oil paints are made. Richardson is in charge of paint production here and she can tell us how you get from the organic color pigment to the tube. We well we begin by mixing the pigment with oils. We mix a blend of safflower and linseed oil. Um, different pigments get different blends of it. We also put in a stabilizer which helps the pigments stay suspended through the oils. Um, after we mix the oils, we mix it for about four hours, then we mill them. In the milling process, you break apart the pigment particles into smaller particulates. This is where you get your nice true color from. After we mix it, mix it and mill it, it sits and rests for a minimum of 45 days. We then fill the tubes. This is done with a piston filler. The piston filler is a semi-automated machine, and um, we actually have a hand operator who puts the tubes in place and then um, they get put on a crimping machine which also puts a batch number on it so we can identify every single one of our batches. I like your quality control here. You really have your eye on everything. We do. We choose to make smaller batches then we can actually control them much more. I know earlier you were telling me that there was a, a uh, part of the process called calcining it. That's how raw sienna gets to burnt sienna. The manufacturer actually heats the raw sienna up into a certain temperature and as it calcines it becomes darker and darker which gives us the wonderful reddish brown burnt sienna we know today. I see like coffee roasting. Kind of like coffee Light roasting, yeah. <laughs> well I want to look around and see how the operation progresses from here. This is the paint lab. I call it uh, Kelly's Kitchen where she cooks up the colors. It's like an industrial strength mixer here. Uh, what's happening in there? What, what color is that? This is Hansa Yellow Light and this is our planetary mixer. The planetary mixer has a lot of horsepower but it mixes nice and slow. And for several hours this mixes and then you get what you want. You make we get what we want to go on to the mill. I see. This is called the milling process. It's the next step after the paints are mixed. 
Here the paints continue to be processed and the already fine particles of pigment are further broken down and crushed several times through a small clearance between these heavy rotating rollers until it reaches a creamy consistency. When we produce our, our paints, we actually want the pigment to dictate what the paint will look like and to feel like so that uh, you know, one particular color of blue might be very different in consistency to some other color in the line because we don't want to try to alter the pigment so that everything has the same feel. We want the, the, the paint really to dictate what the, what the consistency of the product's gonna be like. I see, so a different color might have its own voice. Absolutely. I know sometimes when um, Roger's teaching a class and he has some students that are trying to save money um, on brushes and paint, what happens is really it's a disaster for the student because you can't get quite the line you need if you have a lousy brush, an overused brush, uh, and same thing with the paints. If they're not really covering in the manner you want them to, or if they don't have some body, um, your painting isn't a good. Yeah, it's, it really is um, sort of a, a full savings to go with an inexpensive paint. Uh, one, less expensive paints will have less covering power because you have more filler in there. So even when you have an expensive color like a cadmium or a cobalt, on the surface you may perceive that you're saving money, but being that most um, paints tend to get cut with um, fairly inexpensive white, you're going to use so much more of an inexpensive color to tint your, your, your color that you're trying to reach than you will if you just use a better, a better quality paint from the beginning. For more information about painting and travel with Roger and Sarah Bansimer, visit paintingandtravel.com.